Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Senior Director of Programs at Jewish Funders Network, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's program on rest and rejuvenation, the importance of sabbatical in the Jewish nonprofit sector. This program is part of a joint project of JFN and Upstart called Granted that we launched just about a year ago to help strengthen the relationships between grant makers and grant seekers. In addition to organizing monthly programs such as this one, uh, we have facilitated conversations and Granted also offers a wide range of tools, articles, case studies, and other resources on our website, jgranted.org, and I encourage you to visit that website after this program. Today, we have time together, like I mentioned before, to explore rest and rejuvenation, the importance of sabbaticals in the Jewish nonprofit sector. We will learn about the importance of sabbaticals and how grant makers and grant seekers can work together to build in opportunities for rest and rejuvenation that will strengthen communal leaders and our full sector. This webinar will be moderated by a team from r and Rest of Our Lives, um, and Josh Feldman and Rachel Zelenik, and featured speakers will include Claire Peeps of the Durfee Foundation, a leader in the sabbatical support, and a sabbatical award recipient, Stephanie Clausey Gamer of LA Family Housing. Um, and now I am happy to introduce Rachel from r and Rest of Our Lives to continue us and get us started today. Thank you, Rachel. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to be here with you today. Thank you so much for joining us as we explore why sabbaticals are an important part of our Jewish community. r and was created in the fall of 2021 with the mission to change the world by investing in the well-being of nonprofit professionals through rest and rejuvenation solutions with an equity lens. Those are some big goals, right? Well, we really believe that everyone deserves rest, but even more, we have a distinct and important opportunity right now to shift the ways our workplaces are thinking about the power of rest for its employees and its culture. Our sector is in dire need of strategies that will last and efforts that will meet the moment. We also believe that organizational policies, practices, and changes really need to be developed through an equity lens, and that all policies and practices for an organization must be accessible and attainable for all, and not just for a lucky few. We envision a world where balance between work and life is actually celebrated, where leaders feel supported and cherished in their roles, and where the rest of rejuvenation of talent are seen as instrumental to an organization's success. Our world is rapidly changing. We all know this to be true. The research on this slide cited within an evaluation report for the Claire Rose Foundation Sabbatical Grant Program in San Diego is not new by any means, but it's become clear that not addressing these challenges in a more holistic, sustainable way will only create more friction. r and is in the camp of capitalizing on the opportunity we have in front of us and not revert our workplaces back to pre-COVID times when the stressors were just as high, but rather push ourselves, our leaders, our organizations, our boards, our funders, to envision what is possible and begin taking micro actions to make the possibilities a reality, specifically as it relates to rest, rejuvenation, and recovery for the nonprofit sector. r and currently approaches our work in five ways. They are all experiments in what we call our laboratory for rest and rejuvenation. Each of these approaches will contribute to r and efforts of ground softening, raising awareness, as well as developing efforts that serve the sector's leaders in new and creative ways. Today, we'll be focused specifically on sabbaticals. Different organizations define sabbaticals in unique ways. For the purpose of our program, r and defines sabbaticals as a three-month complete break from work, a total disconnect from the day-to-day -day professional responsibilities, and an open and distinct opportunity to rest the body, replenish the spirit, and activate the mind in whatever way may be best for that individual. r and has chosen sabbaticals as our leading intervention due to decades of research and years of experiences that have showcased that they simply work. In a study titled Creative Disruption, written by TSNE and Compass Point and commissioned by our wonderful co-panelists, the Durfee Foundation, and a number of other funding partners, 
Researchers surveyed that 61 leaders at five different nonprofits that had sabbatical awardees. Each organization had slightly different requirements, but all required at least three months off and discouraged active executives from conducting any business related activities. The researchers found that the majority of leaders surveyed said the time away allowed them the space to generate new ideas for innovating in the organization and help them gain greater confidence in themselves as leaders. The study states that sabbaticals represent an effective and also cost-efficient way, not only to revitalize leaders' passion and interest in their work, but at the same time, increase the capacity of the organizations, develop a second tier of leadership, reframe vision, transmit executive skills to staff, improve board governance, and stimulate closer relationships with funders. Like I noted earlier, sabbaticals are just one intervention to address rest and rejuvenation within the workplace. However, they are also an incredibly important catalyst. Research and implementation has shown that two areas indicating nonprofit effectiveness, leadership and capacity, are proven to be directly impacted by a leader taking a break. RNR's vision is that three years from now, we will have demonstrated the power of sabbaticals in the Jewish nonprofit sector by helping to give our leaders time away from work. Leaders will have a chance to rejuvenate, slow down, and avoid burning out from the demands of their positions. Organizations will ultimately become stronger and healthier, contributing to the long-term success of the projects and the leaders who work for them. It is also truly our hope that sabbatical takers will not only experience the benefit for themselves and the organization they serve as a whole, but will hopefully in turn create and influence new supportive rest focused policies and practices that are sustainable and accessible to, to every single team member at the organization. RNR is following the trailblazing lead of communities and organizations that have paved the way for sabbaticals to become more and more normalized within the nonprofit sector. This year, RNR sabbatical grants will be provided to leaders at five organizations at $60,000 per grant. $50,000 for the awardees to rest, travel, reflect, or renew in whatever manner they propose, and $10,000 to support interim leaders and staff. Our applications actually just opened yesterday. The excitement and momentum is already present. Our team is expecting a highly competitive process with an incredible amount of interest from the community. r is in good company with what we like to call our sister organizations who are doing this work through multiple different lenses. In addition to implementing our own programs, r and really aims to build up and raise awareness for communal efforts, such as the NAP Ministry and Radical Reset, as well as highlight a number of nonprofits within the Jewish community and beyond, such as Ben the Ark, that have taken the steps to implement their own sabbatical policies for their organizations. We are so grateful to forward-thinking partners like the Durfee Foundation, who have inspired so many to think about sabbaticals as a truly sector-wide tool in new and creative ways. We look forward to continuing to learn alongside them and many others as we all normalize, prioritize, and influence rest policies and practices within the nonprofit space. Now, it's truly my pleasure to turn the mic over to Josh Feldman, RNR's founder and visionary. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rachel. Uh, what a wonderful um, introduction to, to our work and this conversation. Um, I'm really honored and pleased uh, to now move into the panel section of this uh, webinar with Claire and Stephanie. Thank you so much for being with us. And in a moment, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. But before they do, we're going to have several panel, uh, excuse me, several um, polls throughout this call. And we're going to open our first poll now with the question of what the top reason that you've joined today is. So as you listen, I encourage you to also fill out this poll and several others through today's call. So for those of you multitasking, a good encouragement to, to focus solely on this conversation. While folks are taking that, I'd love to turn it over to you, Claire, and, um, and then Stephanie to say a couple words of introduction uh, to what brings you to this call. Thank you so much, Josh. It is a great honor and a pleasure to be with all of you this morning. And I am with the Durfee Foundation, a family foundation in Los Angeles County. And our mission is to support people who are making change here in Los Angeles. And the foundation was founded in 1960 and is currently run by 
uh, third generation family members as well as community trustees. And I'll just leave it at that by way of introduction for now and turn it to Stephanie. Thanks, Claire. Stephanie, Hi, maybe morning, you'd say a everybody. couple words of intro. Sure. Um, so good morning, everybody. I'm so excited to be here to share what I learned from being a very grateful recipient of a sabbatical from the Durfee Foundation. But I actually want to just, can I take a minute for some context about sabbatical? So as we're working with a number of Jewish organizations and looking at this, I thought I would remind everybody that in Judaism, we actually have a mandatory, a mandatory sabbatical every seven years. It's called the Shemitah years. And as we might know, 2022 was one of those Shemitah years. And even though this is a, a biblical law that only applies in the land of Israel right now, it's and it's tied to agriculture. What I think is so fascinating about a Shemitah year is we're not supposed to be cultivating our land during that year. And anything that's produced from the land during a Shemitah year, kind of by accident or natural progression, what's produced by the land becomes ownerless in a Shemitah year so that the, the produce is available to anybody, even though sabbaticals really has a benefit to the individual who gets to enjoy it, there is a communal benefit for all of us when we invest in sabbaticals, when we invest in a Shemitah year in whatever that looks like for our organizations. Thanks so much for those lovely introductions. Claire, I wanna to turn to you now uh, to learn a little bit about the origins of the sabbatical program and work at the Durfee Foundation. I wonder if you could speak a little to how and why did the foundation end up doing this work? Sure, so we launched the sabbatical program back in 1997. And at that time, we were seeing leaders who were exiting their jobs really early, uh, <clears throat> simply because it was the only way that they could get a break. And that didn't seem very efficient. Um, so we, uh, the foundation had actually had a prior experiment of sending a handful of leaders away for a restorative break. And it could have kind of put a seed in their minds. In fact, those organizations were selected by a staff member at the foundation. And I think the board thought that's a one-off and we don't really understand the rationale here, but we thought there, there's an important reason for this and we could institutionalize it, make it more equitable and let people apply. So we launched the program initially with just a focus on executive directors and recharging their leadership. We started at two months. We learned it had to be three. I can talk more about this later. And we started really initially just with a focus on the executive directors. And we joke at Durfee sometimes that we're slow learners. And it really took us five years before we realized that the secondary goal of the program was equally important, and that's to build the bench and to strengthen the leadership of the, other, um, of the rest of the organization with the big goal that when an executive director returns to work, they will be able to have jettisoned at least a little bit of their work to the rest of the staff to see a bit of a redistribution of leadership and to allow the leader to have more time and energy to put to the big issues for the organization, visioning and planning and so on. And, uh, and that's the origin. And at the time that we started it, we scoured the field and the only example we could find at the time was the Vanguard Fund in San Francisco, which was funding organizers, only organizers. Um, and we learned later that there was a pre-existing program, the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation um, in, in North Carolina, but we didn't know that at the time. But that was the beginning. And at the very beginning, funders ribbed us and told us it was a terrible idea. And that if leaders uh, got a chance to see the light of day, they would never come back and we would spark a mass exodus from the field. So that's where we began. And we just kind of pushed on and said, well, we're, we're small, let's try, let's see. Uh, and in fact, that hasn't been the case at all. It's been just the opposite. That's the short history. Thanks, Claire. And uh, you know, since uh, those early experiments, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the program is giving a grant to, um, to provide funds towards the sabbatical for three months with a core requirement that the leader is fully unplugging from work 100%. Um, yes. and, um, and there are dollars set aside in the program, not only for the leader sabbatical, but also uh, to what you described for the bench itself uh, for the organization. That's exactly right. It started smaller. It's incrementally grown to just where you are now. It's 50,000 for the sabbatical, salary and expenses, 
more on that. I could tell people um, ways we stretch those dollars um, and then $10,000 to the organization as well. Um, and, uh, and we do say to the fellows that our only goal for them is that they be rigorously non-productive um, and that they are to do nothing with a work-related goal or anything that has a self-imposed deadline to it. And 100% uh, and disconnect, no phone or email contact with any board or staff. And uh, people don't believe that we mean that until they get into the program. And another thing I would just say that I think is important is from the time people are awarded the grant till the time they go is a, is, can be as long as a year. And that's a very important component of the program because it takes a lot of preparation for the organization to be ready. But yes, that's how it's grown over time. Thanks so much, Claire. Stephanie, did you wanna jump in? I just wanted to add one thing. And I don't know if it was unique to our year, Claire, but I don't think it was. In addition to the financial resource and the, the framework that's provided, Durfee also provided us with, um, I'll just say support. I wouldn't say necessarily a coach, but it was somebody who worked with me, worked with my executive team in that year of planning to just you know, provide guidance and support as we planned what the transition of leadership might look like while I was gone, but also to be a point of contact should there be issues amongst my executive team while I was away, they had somebody to talk to. So that was an incredible resource as well. And it might not have been financial, but it was a really good, um, I would suggest that for any organization, we benefited from that tremendously. It is an important extra component. We do uh, on our budget have budgeted for 10 to 12 hours of consulting time for each organization for pre, during and post sabbatical. Um, and the other important component I think is the cohort. And we can talk more about this later, but we now have more than 100 folks who've been through the program and they continue to come back to our semi-annual convenings and we do an overnight retreat every two years. So it's an opportunity for people to go back to the well. And you see when they come together, you can see right from their faces that what's going through people's minds is that memory of, aha, this is what we all share in common. And how are we doing now? And that's a very important part of it. Uh, that's a great segue, Stephanie, to asking a little bit about your experience. I wonder if you could walk us through uh, what your experience was like, what you did with your break, um, and in turn, some of your mindset around doing this. Um, the experience was really nothing short of uh, one of the very best gifts, maybe better than my three children. <laughs> Not better than, but <laughs> um, it was... Uh, it was an extraordinary opportunity. And I remember sharing this with Durfee, even during the application process. It was a pretty rigorous application, I will say. And I do have three kids, two have graduated from college, one is in college now. And I felt like the application was writing a college essay. But the, the process of writing the application gave me an opportunity to dream that I don't believe I had done in easily 15, 20 years. Um, you just don't pause to do that kind of dreaming and visioning of what you would do with time off. So I want to start from there. The dreaming, though, um, did begin with my three kids. And <laughs> see, it was emotional while I was doing the application. It was emotional planning my time off. But what I was committed to, because I realized that my career really demands a lot of my physical and emotional space. And so I wanted that time with my kids. So each one planned, one of them keeps walking by me, so it's making me emotional. Um, each one of them planned a trip that I took alone with them. So I had two weeks with each of my kids and then about three weeks for the five of us as a family and then two weeks by myself. Um, and we did extensive travel. I'm not good with downtime. So I didn't really think of this as, um, what did you call it, Claire? R rigorous, rigorous? Uh, yeah, rigorously non-productive time. <laughs> yeah, so I wouldn't necessarily say it was not productive. I just wasn't productive in a workspace. So I was rigorous, rigorously productive in accomplishing some key goals of mine. And one was travel and one was pushing myself physically and mentally beyond what I did on a daily basis at work. 
So we did some really amazing travel. I took my sabbatical um, in the third quarter of 2019. So framing that around COVID just was an added gift because I can't imagine being able to do the kind of trip we did. Um, so I was in Africa for about a month, um, hiked Kilimanjaro and Mount Whitney with my son. We did a safari as a family. My youngest wanted to spend a couple of weeks in Canada and we did that. And then at the end of the day, I put my hiking boots aside, picked up a few books and puzzles and just spent two weeks by myself in Ventura. I, I mean, at the beach. So that was the gist of my travel. And then your third question, what was it like planning? What was, what did I do? And what was the third piece you had? I was asking about your mindset around this. Uh, for, for many, it's a big leap to, uh, to take a three month break from running an organization. How did you, how did you approach that? And how did you get there? Um, it's interesting. One of the clearly by raising this a couple of times, one of the big um, components of the process for me was the application process. And I remember during one of, during the interview, they asked me a question, something, what would you do to prepare? And I had to pause for a minute and think, and I said, buy a watch. And the, the reason was, Physically, I was doing a lot to prepare because I knew once I started the application process, whether I received the gift from, whether LA Family Housing received the gift from Durfee or not, I did negotiate with my board. I needed a sabbatical and I needed three months off. So I mentally was made that leap in the application process, how badly I needed this. I was really exhausted and didn't feel like I was giving my best self to the organization because of that exhaustion. But in physically preparing to do these major climbs, I would walk every morning or I would hike every morning, but this was my clock. This is not a good clock because it also has texts and it has emails and it has da da da. So I said, I would buy a watch and I had to start turning off during a portion of my day, probably for 10 months before I started the sabbatical. And I would say that is important for people who do feel, you know, this umbilical cord. Um, so that was a big step. The work with my executive team was really huge too, because unlike some organizations, I did not, I don't have within our organizational structure, a number two. I have five executives who make up my executive team who are each chiefs in their departments. Nobody is a generalist for the whole organization. And I you know, am the through thread through all of our work. So we had to start working and thinking differently about how we communicate to each, how they communicate with each other. So the probably 10 months before I left, we also changed our pattern where we used to have um, every week, our whole exec team would meet. One of those meetings for the 10 months before I left was just them meeting with each other and not with me. So that they started a, a, a real um, discipline of communicating differently with each other and losing the reliance on me being that through thread. So that's some of the preparation. And I think they worked hard at it. But when I came back, probably the most profound meeting was the one that our, I don't know what you would have called Lisa, the support person that was provided to us. She met with my team, then she met with me, and then we all came together to hear how it was for them. And uh, within a couple of weeks of me being back before we had that facilitated conversation, there broke out a weird fight amongst my executive team members. And I just walked out. I was like, you all did something right for three months while I was gone. Why did you revert back to this? And I just stepped away and let them figure it out. They worked it out with the coach. And, and when I stepped back in the room, they said, while well, mama bear was gone, we were on our best behavior. As soon as you returned, we reverted back. So we actually spent a lot of time in the couple months after I returned building some systems so that they can continue the type of collaboration they did while I was gone. So I, I think that re-entry and the prep before you leave is as important as the time away. Thanks, Stephanie. And just to, to name sort of connecting some of the research Rachel was sharing at the top, uh, 
Sabbaticals have a direct effect on the recipient. That's perhaps the most obvious. It secondarily has a, a huge effect on the organization, both the deputies with change decision rights, which ultimately often leads to the organization actually growing in many ways, and not only the staff of the organization, but the board as well. So you get these multiple levels that the intervention is working on, creating effectiveness and ultimately um, a better organization. It also begins, which, uh, which I'll just note here, maybe we'll come back to, uh, early stage succession uh, conversations at a board level and a bit of a trial run for the inevitability that in all healthy organizations, eventually CEOs or EDs are stepping away. So with that said, Claire, I'd love to turn back to you on what trends that you are both seeing and have seen, and specifically if anything has changed um, in a COVID world and workplace around this work. Yes, I think that there are sort of two avenues I would follow to answer that question. The first is what has changed in 25 years is that the conversation around rest and renewal has begun to normalize, and that's a marvelous thing. When we, our very first cohort, people were very timid about applying and they were terrified that even by applying, word would get out that they were burned out and that that would be a stigma, right? So one positive change in the field is that people talk about the need for renewal more and are doing more to take steps to get there. They still need support, right? It's still, you need a consultant, you need time. You can't just have a board say, you have a sabbatical, it starts on Monday. You know, it's, it's not gonna work very well, um, though that does happen. During the past two years, I think, of course, um, the pressure has been superhuman for leaders. And we all know that. It's the, the combination of the syndemics of, of our uh, COVID health crisis and racial reckoning at the same time. And now this terrible inflation, I mean, it's just a lot has been going on. So, um, and people are working remotely, uh, which puts a lot of strain on organizations. So for our current sabbatical cohort, first we doubled the number, the only time we've ever done this in history. Um, we usually give um, six awards every two years, this time we gave 13, uh, because the, there was so much desperate need for people to take a chance to step away and recharge. Um, and we also extended the preparatory timeline to 18 months because we recognized that things were very and continue to be very unpredictable. And travel is what most people want to do. And I just want to loop back for a second because of something I think that's important. Durfee's part of the Trust-Based Philanthropy Network and we worked very hard to make applications as streamlined as possible. But Stephanie said that it was a difficult and rigorous application and we know that to be true. And I just want to mention why. Um, emotionally rigorous it wasn't it like is it was because it's a first person <laughs> application it is an application that cannot be turned over to the development staff and the principal questions that there there are three which are why do you do what you do what have you learned along the way and why is this a good moment to step away we used to ask why is this a good moment in the interview process and we stopped doing that because we needed too many kleenex boxes the, the, the issue of, for people, as you saw with Stephanie, to talk about their families, their parents, their aging parents, their, their spouses, their kids who may be suffering depression, any number of things. It's the, the timing for people is critical. We've had many people who've been on our prospect list for 10 years. It needs to be the right moment, not just organizationally, because you know they can't be in a capital campaign or they're not, you know, whatever is happening. They have the turnover in staff. Um, but it's a moment in their personal lives. Kids are graduating, they're going off to college, you know, whatever. So these things, so it is a more personal, people say to us, it's deceptively simple. They're simple questions, but they end up writing them at the kitchen table at three in the morning, right? Right, so, so the trend I would say though, is that people are now starting to create their own smaller versions of sabbaticals. And our big goal, we always say is, and this is why I'm so thrilled to be talking with you all at Josh and Rachel and everybody through the Jewish Funders Network. Durfee's small, we can't scaling. Scaling for us is, is replication and spreading of the idea. And I think that it's taken 25 years and we're still talking about burnout, but that's a thing, that's a trend and a change. People are trying to figure out what can we do? How do we do it either with with funders supporting them or even on their own. 
Thanks so much for that. that th this next question is for both of you and Stephanie, maybe we'll start with you, um, which is, you know, um, this is a costly intervention. Uh, so especially for the skeptics out there who, uh, who ask why do this when we could invest in other, our resources in other ways, why have sabbatical programs? So Stephanie first and then Claire afterwards. I think, as I said at the beginning, the investment is beyond the, the benefit for me and really lets me lead in a different way when I returned and it allowed my staff this opportunity. So the staff, an opportunity to be working together to function without me, et cetera. Um, it is a big investment. And, um, you know, I combined my, my vacation time and my sick time and da 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 so that I had an opportunity to travel and be paid my regular salary. So it sort of combined those two things, which is really important. Um, but why invest? It, I would say, so when I returned, the first month that I returned, which was October of 19, we really spent that month developing a framework to roll out sabbatical programs for my executive team members as well. Sadly, COVID hit because we talked about having a good six to eight months before they left so that we as an organization and within their departments could strengthen their bench to lead while they took time off. So we were beginning to map that out that was going to begin the fall of 2020. Nothing's begun yet. We doubled in size as an organization these past two years, whatever. But the, as Claire just beautifully said, we can't always scale what we do but we can share what we're doing. And I felt that really happened for us at LA Family Housing because we were sharing this opportunity of the rest of rejuvenation with our executive team. Until you have it modeled once, it's hard to envision how it would work. So I think the investment is so critical because it's going to touch more than one person. You, I know my colleagues who were part of my cohort as well, tried to roll out sabbatical programs for their teams also. So I do think the investment, um, you know, there's a domino effect and it touches far deeper within the organization, which is why it's valuable. Thanks, Stephanie. Claire, what, what do you think to add to that? So from a very pragmatic standpoint, I would say that investing in a sabbatical is a lot less expensive than investing in executive transition. That's very expensive. Um, and that extends also to the senior staff, not just the principal leader. So, I mean, that's just a kind of, a, you know, if you want to get down to the, the dollars involved, it's, it's a more cost-effective way to um, keep people uh, engaged in sustainability of the work. But it also is about culture change. And it's a worthy investment in culture change because it radiates out, as Stephanie's just mentioned. It begins to affect and change the culture of, going, of an organization going forward. You've just seen Stephanie articulate that by trying now to find ways to extend the opportunity. And that's our dream come true to other staff, senior staff. So you begin to build in a culture of care for an organization. And that has long-term benefits that are both um, productivity in terms of the, the the depth of, of effectiveness and compassion and trust between an, an organization and its neighbors and the people that they're serving, it radiates out, right? I mean, it's, a, it's, fundamentally, about, it's fundamentally about kindness um, and, and, and how organizations approach their work and, uh, and thinking about sustainability of the work. So, um, and it, it radiates out also in the culture of nonprofit sector writ large. So I think it's, a, it's the ripple effect of tossing a pebble in the water um, and other people will begin to see that they might be able to change their pace and still sustain their productivity to a better end. So, you know, at the end of the day, the other thing I would say, I say to people, we have a DIY guide on our website. It's fabulous to get a grant to go for, to have a sabbatical. You don't have to have one to take the break, right? That we are used to people taking maternity leave all the time and paternity leave. And that need not be an expensive venture. Having the additional funding for travel and so on, having a coach to get ready, those things, yes, those are additional costs, but actually the cost of taking the leave need not, you don't need to bring an extra staff person in to replace that one. It's other staff 
we're going to learn, right? So we do encourage people, even if you don't have a grant, explore how you can make this happen in your organization. And especially for long tenure directors, it's a, it's a responsibility of the board to be taking care of your CEO. So yeah, that's all I'll say for now. Thanks so much, Claire. Uh, as we uh, continue the conversation, we're gonna open up the second poll. And the, the question on this poll is, what's the longest that you've taken away from work uh, without responding to emails? So not just a vacation, but a break of some sort where, uh, where you actually didn't get on that phone or computer. So to Stephanie's point, perhaps you picked up a watch uh, in order to help make that happen. Um, and we're curious in your honest answer. Um, while that poll is open, uh, we, we wanna move on to, to speak about equity a little bit. And I wanna start with you, Claire. Um, how do you think about equity within the granting process for sabbaticals? Thank you. It's such an important question. And there are uh, a range of answers. The first is that we have always used a peer review process. And so it's, you know, it, it begins to um, share perspective with colleagues in the field. And we choose our, our panelists very carefully as people who represent a range of everything in Los Angeles, geography, ethnicity, um, sub issue area. We have a financial litmus test too and we will turn away organizations. You have to have either personal or organizational need to take the sabbatical. Um, we've actually coached many boards of candidates who have applied to say to them, um, we know our dollars don't stretch enough, far enough to serve everybody. We hope that you might find the resources in your organization and that's often effective. But typically speaking, we do, um, we do focus our funds on organizations that need the support for, to make this happen. And we began at the very beginning saying that we want the recipients of this program to reflect Los Angeles. And we are blessed to live in a place that is very diverse. So I think that the diversity of the, of the folks who've participated in the program has been um, at the forefront. And we're more explicit about that now. And the last thing I would say is, I'm leaving today after this meeting to go to the inaugural meeting of our LARC awardees, uh, which address an equity gap in our program because it does, the sabbatical tilts a little bit larger because organizations have to have a sufficient number of staff uh, and stability and infrastructure to be able to withstand a leader being gone for three months. So we recognize that there's been a gap of some smaller neighborhood centered organizations that haven't been able to qualify perennially for our guidelines. So we've launched a companion program to provide collective care for the uh, staff of smaller organizations. And that's also very much a, an equity driven um, response. And I just saw the, the can, I, can we see the poll response again for a second? It flashed up while I was talking. Yikes. <laughs> I'll, I'll just add to that, Claire. Um, it's striking that uh, that with some um, current research showing that in the nonprofit sector, up to 50% are either burned out of our workers are either burned out or arriving close to burnout, that, um, that even, uh, even for the vacation or breaks in place that you can see reflected in this poll uh, on this very call that folks are not taking full breaks. Um, and though that is not the only solution to burnout, um, uh, there's 20 years of research supported by the Durfee Foundation and others to, to support this being a really important leg of the stool. So I'll get off my soapbox there, but it feels like if, if it doesn't put it into stark contrast already in this conversation, um, we have a real challenge uh, to, to be as effective as we can in the nonprofit sector by taking care of our talent. Um, so with that, uh, um, we're going to open up for, uh, for questions in a moment, but before we do, um, I, I wonder if we could just go to you, Stephanie, on, uh, on one last piece of the puzzle we talked less about, which was, uh, what was your first conversation with your board chair yet? And for those executives on the call today, considering having that conversation, what would be one or two pieces of advice of how to approach that conversation with their board or board chair? The conversation that that I wanted a sabbatical? Yeah, when you decided to apply for this and take mm -hmm. a, uh, consider yeah, applying, was, how did you go to your board and, and what would you recommend others considering it would say to theirs? So I wanna answer that in one minute. I do wanna do one more follow-up to Claire's answer about the equity. 
Um, as she mentioned before, I would say one of the most stellar pieces of the Durfee sabbatical program that I would encourage all other foundations to provide is this cohort relationship. That is, um, you know, you're part of a cohort, the six, or in this case, this year's 12 um, leaders who took sabbatical, they come together regularly. I think we came together monthly, every other month? I every, the, the, the alumni come together every six months. No, but the cohort. Anyway, I felt like we had these different meetings that were just so necessary. And, you know, I, I believe there is a goal um, within Durfee, but I'm not positive about this, not to have uh, leaders from the same sector all homeless service providers leaving at the same time or all leaders within you know, uh, pro bono legal services or healthcare services all leaving at the same time. So there is a diversity in the disciplines and types of organizations that we run um, that represent Los Angeles as well. And then being having the continuity of that diversity as in your cohorts um, and the support within the alumni network is really great because I know that I have access and relationships now that I didn't have before, that I can call on somebody where there is a, a, an issue expertise that I need to bring to LA Family Housing. And I think that also adds to the, the equitable service delivery to our participants and our clients because of the relationship with the other providers. So I just wanted to plug that. Um, I appreciate you asking this about my board chair conversation because it was um, it was actually very profound. I remember it. And I have a rare um, situation. I don't know that all executive directors have this. I actually, um, I've been at LA Family Housing for 15 years in my role. I am wrapping up my third um, five-year employment agreement. I was in the, just about to start my conversation about my next five-year employment agreement when I was applying for the Durfee in 2018. I applied in 2018 and took it in 2019. And um, as I mentioned earlier, starting the process of the application triggered um, how much I needed this. And so I negotiate, I, I brought the conversation about the desire for a time off into that negotiation of my next five-year agreement that sometime within this next five-year agreement, I want to take three months paid off, which I will say I never had done. I never actually took maternity leaves um, because I never worked in large enough nonprofits that was able to support that time off. And my husband and I, our life is structured in a way that I couldn't have a we we were dependent on both of our incomes all the times that our kids were born. So I think I took two weeks off with the first kid, four weeks for the next kid, and three weeks for the next kid, something like that. Um, that's not right. That wasn't good for my body. That wasn't good for my mind. So this was my, you know, 18 year later, <laughs> maternity leave with each kid. Um, but I do think the conversation was, I led with, I want to put this in my five-year agreement because I want to be really clear. I have no intention of leaving. And we also have some constraints given the public dollars that we receive on any salary. I, I went flat for many years when we brought up other staff within the organization so that we didn't create great disparity between the highest earner and the lowest wage earners within the organization. Part of that is in principle, part of it is defined by our public contracts. They put those restrictions. And so there were ways that I, um, couldn't be compensated. And I was asking for this to be a form of compensation was giving me time off. And so I framed the conversation with my board chair. I'm staying, I love the work I'm doing. This I believe, whatever year I said, would be a good time to take a break. We had just come off of a 10 year, um, a five year capital campaign. And I think that helped the conversation. She was very receptive to it, very supportive of it. And I believe we needed a letter from our board chair at the time of application, just so that it wasn't a surprise that we were applying. And I, I opened that conversation very early with her before I submitted the application. 
Thanks so much. Uh, and uh, for any board chairs on the call today, this can happen in the other direction. You don't need a sabbatical grant program to start a program like this in your organization. So perhaps you wanna be starting those conversations as well. Uh, with that, we, we wanna to turn to questions. So feel free to put your questions in the chat and we'll look to aggregate them and answer as many as we can. Um, and while, uh, while that's happening, um, uh, I'll just uh, I'll just note that um, that our program is directly based on the Durfee's model. That we're taking the 20 years of research, wisdom, and expertise, and looking to apply it to a different subsector. And uh, just to return to a point that Claire was making early earlier, the the need is greater than ever because of COVID and the pressure that's been put on our leaders over the past years. And we will join a cadre of folks supporting REST across the nonprofit sector. I, I think a big audacious question for all of us in the next five years is how can we create the kind of REST and rejuvenation supports um, to, uh, to support the most important part of the, the talent, the most important asset of the nonprofit sector, which is talent. Um, and, uh, and with that, just encouragement to, to put your uh, questions in the chat uh, for the panel. And while those are coming in, I'll just, I'll just ask one um, that, uh, that, that hasn't come in yet, but may from the skeptics. And this one's for you, Claire. There's sometimes a concern from either uh, philanthropists or boards that a sabbatical is going to tee up someone leaving the organization. But what did you find through um, through the 100 plus sabbaticals that Durfee has been a part of. Did folks take this and, and leave uh, upon returning? Uh, I'm happy to say that in well more than 100 awardees at this point, not one has left their organization um, prior, that's with one exception, and we knew that in advance, um, less than two years plus, and many of their still many years later. So it's a myth actually. But I do think that it's important to note that it's an important screening question. And it's a, pan it's a question that panelists want to be asking and reviewing. It's like, what, what, where do you see yourself in five years? We're very clear that we do not intend our sabbatical grant to be a transitional grant. So if somebody's thinking of retiring in two years, unfortunately for us, it's too late. Um, if they're thinking about making a shift into academia, journalism, whatever, consulting, we will not make an award to those organizations because we want the organizations to have the benefit of this renewed leadership team working together. So I think it's something that you have to have antenna up um, for when you are uh, in the application review process. So in part of it, in part of its reflection of that, but, but really people who are in the work because the answers to the question of why they do what they do are so profound, they're not likely to leave. It's their life work, whether it's this organization. The other thing I would say though, change happens. And our goal neither is to keep people um, chained to their organizations until their retirement. We do recognize that people grow and may move on to a larger organization, to a peer organization, whatever, and we celebrate that. So that also happens along the way, but never in, never in a disruptive moment shortly after a sabbatical. Great, thanks so much, Claire. Um, a question or two coming in on r and model. The, the first is if we're going to be offering a coaching piece to our program, and the short answer is yes. And, um, and drawing from some of the expertise of the Durfee Foundation, we'll be looking to create a group of coaches who have experienced themselves uh, taking sabbaticals um, from executive director or CEO seats to create a, 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 some options for who those coaches may be. Um, and a, a second question coming in uh, about r and R's model um, was just um, if we'll be including any Jewish learning. And I'll say uh, I'll say yes um, and add to where we started with Stephanie's point about some of the technology and wisdom within Jewish tradition that we have beautiful thinking within our tradition about rest, rejuvenation, and um, and its power. And uh, as a uh, as Rabbi Joshua Abraham Heschel says, some of this work is about creating a sanctity of time. And part of how we'll do that is learning together, but also doing that in cohort so that it's peer to peer and whoever is in the program has the benefit to teach each other as well as, um, as, well as learn from each other. Um, back to the panel. 
Oh, Can I just after you, Stephanie, something please. Funny. Sorry, Clara. I always use this example because I think it was funny. In my application, you had to write what you wanted to be doing with your time off. And one of the things that I wanted to do was return to Mahon Pardes in Jerusalem to do some tech study, something I had done, you know, right after college. And I was encouraged not to do that. Um, not because Durfee has anything against, you know, study of that kind and soul filling of that kind, but I must have described it as a very rigorous program and they, they wanted you to be rigorously non-programmed. And um, it's good. I, I found my way to tech study while I was off anyway, but, and I probably climbed more mountains if I hadn't gone, you know, because I didn't go to parties, but, um, but I thought it was funny. I'm like, they don't understand. It's not work. It's like, you know, teaching my soul. So I love that you're going to have that component. Um, and I did want to add one thing about the coaching too, because in addition to the coach that was provided to support and prepare the organization for the leader's departure, we also had a buddy, um, someone else who had previously been on sabbatical to just meet with us where you can ask some questions you might not feel comfortable asking someplace else. And um, I thought that was helpful and some constructive feedback when we returned that we were invited to give that I told Durfee is, I think it's real important to, to match maybe like size organizations with their buddy because I do run a larger organization and the buddy that I was matched with, I think had like four employees and we have about 480. We probably only had about 300 when I went on sabbatical, but it was still very different issues. So as you think about a buddy system or coaching system that they have um, some alignment likeness in their structures. Great. Uh, another question in a uh, question coming in is um, uh, this one for you, Claire. You know, is there requirements on reflections or learnings uh, following the sabbatical, um, or is it just free time? Yeah, there are. There are. Uh, we ask for closing letter. We don't ask for final report. Uh, we ask for a closing letter no longer than three months after the conclusion of the sabbatical um, on the experience. Tell us what you did. Tell us what you learned. Tell us what will stay with you. Tell us what advice you have for us. Um, which also includes what advice do you have for other fellows who will be going. And we have a compilation now of many years of advice from other fellows that we share with new awardees. So here, here are tips from folks who've been on the experience. Sometimes they contradict one another, but that's okay, right? I think different things resonate for people. Um, and also the process, I think, of writing that is just, again, it's a part of, it's all iterative of people going back to the, um, to the wellstone and remembering what they did and uh, finding ways to do that on a regular basis. They also um, have a, the, the cohort, when we interview people, we do ask about, there, there is this cohort of people who come together. Do you imagine that that would be of any value to you? And try to kind of get some sensitivity around that because um, people who are not interested are just gonna stay in their tunnel. We're less likely to select those people than those who want to be part of the cohort because the cohort is how the lessons learned become embedded in the organization and are shared among one another. So it's kind of a light touch um, feedback. We do also ask for a letter from the management, the interim leadership, likewise, um, what the experience was like for them and what advice they would have for us. And it's, it's in a letter format. We're just coming up on time. I wanna express my deep gratitude uh, to Claire Peeps and the Durfee Foundation for being a leader in this work over the last 20 years. Um, and in turn, um, we really stand on giants at uh, the shoulders of giants at r, r as we begin doing this work in our pilot. And likewise, uh, Stephanie, gratitude for you sharing some of your experience um, uh, before, during, and after taking your own sabbatical and its effect on your leadership and organization. Um, we look forward to continuing this conversation in the weeks and months to come. Uh, a shameless plug, I'm putting a link in the chat to, to our call for sabbaticals. If you know someone who's an executive director or CEO of an organization working with the Jew in the Jewish nonprofit subsector in the United States, uh, please uh, send, them, uh, send them this link and give them a nudge. And while I'm on that, I'll just note for the philanthropists on the call, that uh, something I've learned from Durfee is that it's incredibly meaningful if a funder 
um, encourages a grantee organization to apply to a sabbatical program. It begins to credential it and make space for them to have that difficult or easy conversation, in Stephanie's case, a conversation with their boards, um, and may uh, position this differently in their thinking. Um, with that, uh, as we close, I want to pass it over to Tamar. Thank you so much, Josh, and thank you, Rachel, from before, and thank you, Stephanie and Claire, for sharing sharing the importance of sabbaticals and rest and rejuvenation and sharing so much of yourselves today and your work. And with that, I also wanna thank my colleagues at Upstart that helped um, make all these connections and put this together today behind the scenes. Thank you for, for doing that. And I wanted to mention next month, we are going to meet again on June 22nd. We'll send out more information uh, soon. Um, our next webinar, granted webinar, will be about, uh, about participatory grant making. And we look forward to learning again soon with all of you. Have a great day.